Organized crime is alive and well, with the Cosa Nostra ruling Sicily, the Camorra waging never-ending war in Naples, and the Undergetta building its wealth in Calabria. Rome, meanwhile, remains unconquered, but that does not mean it's free of crime. Here the streets are divided between small, independent gangs that never gain any significant power. Among these is petty criminal Libanese, who, along with his friend Dandy and a few other accomplices, makes a score stealing a truckload of typewriters. Rather than distribute the funds amongst his friends, Libano decides to purchase guns. In a strange twist of fate, Libano's car containing the hidden guns is stolen and sold to local thugs Freddo and the Buffoni brothers, who discover the hidden weapons. When Libano comes to claim it, he tells Freddo that he's planning the kidnap and ransom of a prominent wealthy figure. The two decide to combine forces and pull the job together. This marks the beginning of Banda della Magliana, a gang birthed amidst a period of extreme political chaos that would go on to become Rome's most influential criminal organization. The first thing you'll notice about Romanzo Criminale, it's got style. The intro plunges us into the 70s aesthetic, teasing us with sex, guns, drugs, car chases, stacks of money. It's dirty, it's chaotic, it's crime, man. Retro style. That aesthetic continues as we get into the episode. This doesn't look like a show filmed in 2008. It has a grainy texture, the colors and lighting feel off like you're watching an old TV, and of course, all the characters lean hard into classic 70s fashion. It creates a strong sense of nostalgia. And if that's all the show was, it would probably fall flat. But rather than relying on nostalgia as a shtick, Criminala uses it to highlight the tragedy of its characters. No one in the gang starts off innocent. They're murderers from episode one. But even so, they don't come off as hardened criminals. I mean, just look at how proud he is showing off his first ransom note. Huh? In many ways, they seem more like boys playing at what they think a criminal is. One of the scenes that got me hooked on the series is in episode two, when Freddo, Dandy, and Libano are at the beach waiting for a shipment of drugs. This soccer ball hits them, and the music turns kind of sinister as Libano scowls at the guy who kicked it. Scusate, non, non volevo. But then Freddo says, Mano partidella. And then they make new friends and play a game of soccer. Trying to portray any of these people as reluctant or remorseful criminals would be insulting. It belittles the seriousness of their actions and the impact they have on the victims. But here we have a genuine moment of innocent joy. It's a forceful reminder that these violent thugs are still human. These happy moments disappear as the series goes on. The gang's success in the underworld alienates them from that simpler part of themselves, driving them further into paranoia, isolation, and ego. While we can't forgive or excuse what they do, it is hard not to think of those smiling kids playing soccer and wonder who they might have been if they had chosen a simpler life. Aiuto! 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 Banda della Magliana was founded on one core principle. Un'intesa tra pari livello, tutti capi. E nessun servo. It was this condition that convinced these juvenile, violent criminals to band together. And on paper, it held true. Everyone received an equal share of the earnings, and no one member was considered superior to another. But even without a set hierarchy, no one can deny that Libano is the heart of the group. 
A believer in fascism, he saw potential in Rome's chaotic criminal world. He knew that with enough muscle and leverage, a disciplined unit could put this city under its thumb. While other members of the gang squandered their money, he made investments for their future. He built alliances with the Camorra and Sicilians, skillfully playing both against each other so that his gang could maintain its autonomy while benefiting from their protection. He even struck a deal with the Italian secret services, offering them information and favors in exchange for legal protection. In less than three years, he became one of the most powerful figures in Rome. Libano has a very chaotic energy. Francesco Montanari was a perfect cast for this role. He has this deranged, menacing scowl that really makes you feel like he's always on the verge of losing it. Libano never comes off as cunning, exactly. It's more like he's crazy enough to get away with anything. That doesn't mean he's stupid or impatient. He's actually very good at biding his time to strike at the perfect moment. It's like he always has some grand goal in mind, and he's going to claw his way there no matter the risks or consequences. And while this is the spark that ignites the gang's success, it also leads to his downfall. In spite of all his ambition, Libano doesn't actually know what he wants. Once the gang secures its place on top, he grows increasingly paranoid and reckless, going so far as to antagonize his most powerful allies. He got everything he wanted, but it's still not enough. He still has to prove something. Throughout the gang's numerous victories, Libano leaves the celebrations feeling empty, and it's at these times his thoughts turn to his mother. We see early on that these two were very close. His father wasn't around, so she raised him on her own. She was a hard-working, law-abiding woman who couldn't afford much luxury, and it made his stomach turn. He knew that she deserved more, that they both deserved more, and starting this gang was going to be how he got it for them. But as soon as she realized what her son was involved in, his mother cut off all contact. She knows what this life leads to, and that as long as he keeps at it, he's as good as dead. Che te frega come ho pagata? L'importante è che sei felice, ma. Un figlio che si mette nei guai non mi farà mai felice. Ah, ma io nei guai ci finisco, ho capito. Ma non voglio manco finire a merda come mio padre. Non parla così di tuo padre, capito? O più alle cose tue vattene. E io non vedete per niente che vederti morto ammazzato, perché è così che finirai Pietro. It's a slow burn, but this is the wound that destroys Libano. It's true that he wanted power and respect for its own sake, but extending those gifts to his mother was the one thing that would have really given meaning to it all. Her rejection leaves him empty. He set out to prove something to everybody, but in the end he couldn't share it with the one person he never had to prove anything to. Like a child acting out for attention, all he can do is scream and cry outside her door. <laughs> Degna di te, della regina di Roma. Non te dovrai più vergognare me. Ma apri sta cazzo di porta. Dai, ma! Bisogna mandare un segnale in fretta e a tutti. Vabbè, ma perché sporcasse con Satana? Quella è un buono solo per la pesca. Sì, ma con noi pure i vermi se stanno a fare le uni. È Satana che ha parlato stamattina e si è fatto sentire da tutti. È Satana il segnale Libano. Fredo is a criminal to his core. Independent and rebellious, he jumped on Libano's plan to take over Rome. He's a quick thinker who always plans for the worst, and it's those qualities that help the gang survive a very rocky start. He was a good balance for Libanese, who was so sure of his success that he would jump into risky situations without planning for contingencies. Libano knew right away that he needed Fredo to make his dream a reality. Che? Te rode che la cifra di chiesta dal freddo? No, anzi. Il freddo è sveglio, Dandy. Ma se avevamo trovato quello giusto. Giusto per fare che? Fredo was committed to keeping the gang autonomous. He never liked it when they struck deals with outside groups like the Mafia or government. He was a rebel, and he believed that the gang needed to be independent at all costs. He joined up with Libano because he believed they shared an us-against-the-world mentality. And while that camaraderie gave the gang a strong foundation, the group's success ironically made Fredo less satisfied with it. Becoming more established meant building bridges with the groups he had spent his whole life rejecting. Secondo te a noi mo ci serve de lavorare per quelli? Sì. Stiamo a fare un favore allo Stato, Fre. 
e a me non me va di fare i favori a chi non mi sei inculato pena vita, a chi mi fa morire di fame e se mi ribello mi sbatte pure al gabbio, a me dello Stato non me ne frega un cazzo, hai capito Libano? It might appear that the show tries to whitewash Freddo. He holds himself with more dignity than the others, he's a deep romantic, and he's always looking out for his little brother who is still stuck at home with their dysfunctional parents. He comes off as the honorable criminal, the one who's never cruel for cruelty's sake. He's a bad guy but not one without a code. At least, that's the narrative he tells himself. His actions tell a different story. For as much as he pretends to care about his little brother, he doesn't waste any time hitting on his girlfriend. Reluctantly, of course. He definitely never thought this platonic date at the carnival would make her fall in love with him. <laughs> the compassion he shows for his brother is just a surface level act. He's never there for him when it really counts. The kid keeps getting into trouble just by being related to him, and when he's finally put into a life or death situation where he's forced to wear a wire, Fredo cuts him off completely. The circumstances don't matter to him, his brother doesn't matter to him. All he really cares about is his identity as the honorable criminal. And it's this same twisted sense of honor that leads him to commit some of his worst crimes. Most of his murders are motivated purely by a mafia-style sense of respect. He even kills one of his closest friends for some minor betrayal, and when asked why he did it, he can't even come up with an answer. No. Fredo is always playing the violin for himself while pretending he's never had one music lesson. He ruins the lives of the people closest to him and uses their pain to fuel his own sad story. In the gang's later years, Fredo just sort of drifts away. He got on board with Lebanese to create a crew that his rebellious teenage self could be proud of. But that's where his ambition ended. When the gang needed to evolve, he didn't have the vision to make it happen. As he grows older and lonelier, he's forced to realize that he was just a rebel without a cause. It was a meaningless life that only caused pain. So sad. Ma che gente ricorda? Guarda, mi cazzo. So sad. Che vuoi? Spara io. Ma è un cadavere. E tu gli spari lo stesso. Ma lo vedi, è morto. Spara io. Deve essere chiaro che l'abbiamo fatto tutti e tre insieme. Ma chiaro a chi? Che siamo la mafia che quando ammazza parla in codice. Ho detto spara io. Sei contento? Affanculo, fre. Dandy, dandy, dandy. The most hateable character in the show, in my opinion. He's easy to write off as a joke at first glance, what with his love of disco and the countless hours he spends buying panties for his favorite sex worker. Perché non può farne a meno? Perché lui è il dandy, lui è il viver della batteria. Ma la mente è un'altra, è uno di questi. But it is a mistake to underestimate him. Dandy is the type of guy who wants nothing less than the best, but he's not bold or cunning enough to get it for himself. He's a selfish opportunist who always takes the path of least resistance. When the gang makes its first big score, Dandy decides he'll spend his share on Rome's best prostitute. He immediately becomes obsessed with her and refuses to sleep with anyone else. She makes it explicitly clear that she's only interested in his money and that suits him just fine. It's simple transactional. He thinks that paying Patrizia to be his exclusive girlfriend means he'll get full-time access to the persona she puts on for her customers, and you can imagine how well that turns out for both of them. His obsession with Patrizia is a prime example of how unwilling he is to work for the finer things he craves. He was extremely lucky to fall in with Libano and Fredo. As they drive the gang towards success, Dandy stumbles into more and more lucrative opportunities. In the early days, he would begrudgingly do dirty work for the crew's behalf, but as they gained more influence, he would delegate his work to Mafia Hitman. The rest of the gang resented him for this, but there was nothing they could do about it. Most of them burned through their money while Dandy hopped on the investments Libano set up, making him the most successful member of the crew. His arc is possibly the most interesting of the three bosses. Fredo and Libano don't change too much from how they started, but Dandy's success really brings out his worst qualities. 
He transforms from a petty thug into a ruthless capitalist. Seeing him at the end, it's hard to believe this was the same guy we saw singing and dancing in his car back in the day. The gang's downfall can largely be attributed to Dandy's success. He soon became their biggest source of income, and he realized that there was no benefit in working with them anymore. He dropped any pretense of camaraderie, leaving them to struggle with the police and their money troubles. Like other members of the gang, the tragedy of Dandy can be seen in the glimpses of the genuine person we see from time to time. While he never cared too much about the other members, his friendship with Libano ran deep. It may be the only meaningful relationship he had in his life. Their friendship strained as Libano became more paranoid, and eventually Dandy was forced to put it in his past. This essentially destroyed the only part of him that would act out of honor, compassion, or loyalty. That's not to say that Libano was some champion for those things, but people can often dig out their best qualities on behalf of someone they care about. Without Libano, Dandy had nothing real left in his life. He put all of his energy into having the best clothes, the best house, the best wife, even the best tomb, and he managed to build a very large, very hollow life for himself. Chi ti ha detto che vengo? Non mo di nessuno. Te sei la donna mia e vieni, punto. I matrimoni mi fanno schifo. Sono noiosi e fracassoni. Vorrò dire che questo tu fai piacere. È qui che non capisci. Se sono la tua donna sono libera di scegliere. E invece mi ordini cosa fare? Allora sono soltanto la tua puttana. Dai, quanto vuoi per venire? Puoi comprare il mio tempo, non la mia noia. Io ti aspetto. Aspetta pure. Nessuno l'ha visto in faccia e nessuno ha preso la targa della moto. Il giudice non convaliderà il fermo. Cosa sta cercando di fare, Scialoia? Passare all'attacco. Finora abbiamo giocato di rimessa, no? E abbiamo sempre perso. E loro si sono presi Roma. E adesso cambiamo strategia. C'è una rapina col morto? Andiamo a vedere se sono stati loro. C'è un furto? Andiamo da loro. Qualsiasi cosa succede, andiamo a vedere se sono stati loro. Facciamogli sentire il fiato sul collo. Facciamogli sentire la pressione addosso. Tanto comunque sia, c'è sempre un'ottima possibilità che siano stati loro. Va bene. Va bene. From the moment it was born, Banda della Magliana had an enemy. Nicola Shaloya was a young cop eager to earn his reputation. Unfortunately for him, he was already an outcast for being a suspected communist. He wasn't, of course, but his sister was, and that was all it took for the rumors to fly and put his career at a standstill. Still, he was determined to make his mark, and he finally got his chance when assigned to the Baron Rossellini kidnapping. While most of his peers were ready to write it off as the work of communists, he was the first to consider the possibility of a new criminal conspiracy. This began the work that would consume more than a decade of his life, and would ultimately leave him crippled and destitute. Shaloya is mostly a well-done character. He's not unlikable, especially compared to our main characters, but he's not a virtuous hero either. His obsession with the gang is at first driven by career-climbing ambition, and it leads him to make some stupid, reckless moves that sabotage the investigation. Ma già, lei è il tipo lavao la spacca, vero? Se le dice bene avrà la foto sui giornali. Se no c'è sempre un PM a parlarle il culo, no, Shaloya! He's forced to grow out of his lone hero fantasy as he realizes that stopping the gang must be the first priority. He eventually encounters Patrizia, and after snooping through her home and learning more about who she is underneath the sex worker persona, he develops a somewhat creepy obsession with her. Patrizia actually returns his affections and the two develop a dysfunctional relationship. This only furthers his hatred for the gang as he desperately tries to keep Dandy away from her. But Shaloya was fighting a losing battle from the start. His biggest obstacle was not the gang itself, but his own boss. As mentioned earlier, the Italian secret services were collaborating with the gang, so they consistently stymied Chiloia's investigation. They blackmailed him, destroyed evidence, and kept the gang out of prison numerous times. 
After years of hard work, Shaloya managed to get all of them on trial for murder and criminal conspiracy, but it took little more than a nudge from the Secret Services to reduce the charges so that no one ended up serving more than a decade, effectively painting his entire campaign as a madman's conspiracy. Sentenza, accolta con vive manifestazioni di gioia dai deputati, ha in pratica sconfessato l'operato degli inquirenti, negando persino l'esistenza stessa della banda criminale. Shaloya is kind of a punching bag in this story. He makes several attacks on the gang, but they see him as little more than an annoyance. Even as he grows out of his glory-seeking phase, his efforts never yield any real results, and he's finally forced to accept that he can't win. It wasn't the gang itself that broke him, but the system working behind the scenes. The gang had power, influence, and intel, all things that the people in charge found more valuable than a lone cop trying to stop criminals. Now, this is the only character ending I'm going to spoil because I feel like I have to to properly examine his arc, so skip to this timestamp if you prefer not to hear it. After getting maimed and forced into a desk job, Shaloya lives a very depressing life. One day he gets a visit from the head of the Secret Services, the same one who spent so many years ruining his investigation. He offers Shaloya a job as his replacement. I wasn't too sure about this ending for him at first. I felt it was unfairly cynical and that he had earned a little more growth. But looking back on it, my first impression may have been too generous. From episode 1, Shaloya has a front row seat to police corruption as his colleagues gleefully talk about murdering protesters. And while he is sickened by their attitude, the reaction is primarily driven by concern for his sister, who could easily be their next victim. Nonetheless, he still believes he can do something good as a cop, and spends the next 10 years having that hope beaten out of him. So when this miserable old man comes offering him real power, it must sound tempting. Here is a position where you can really make a difference. Sure, it's been used for corruption in the past, but if you have it, you can use it for good. You can finally be the hero you always wanted to be. Lei non ha rinunciato alla sua fissazione di giustizia. Lei ha lo sguardo giusto per ordinare il mondo che verrà. And so, when he accepts the offer, Shaloya proves that he really hasn't learned anything at all. He will continue as an agent of a corrupt system with the same naive belief that this time, things will be different. Che lavoro ha trovato? Avrò il diritto di sapere qualcosa, no? Sono tuo fratello. No. Tu sei solo uno sbirro di merda. era appena uscito dalla sua residenza e si stava dirigendo verso il Parlamento per il voto di fiducia al nuovo governo Andreotti, quando è stato intercettato da un comando di terroristi, presumibilmente delle Brigate Rosse. Nell'azione sono stati uccisi tutti e cinque gli uomini della scorta dell'onorevole Moro. Romanzo Criminale is very, very, very loosely based on true events. Obviously, you can't use it as a historical reference. It's a show, adapted from a movie, adapted from a novel, so we are far removed from reality here. That said, it is interesting to look at the details that line up with real-life events. Lebanese, Fredo, and Dandy all had real-life counterparts, and the timeline of events was roughly the same including the chance meeting between Fredo and Lebanese with the stolen car. In fact, some of the more unbelievable events of the show actually were taken from real life. For instance, as the gang gets more notoriety, they eventually come into contact with a prominent fascist organization who wanted them to commit criminal acts of terror on their behalf. In exchange, the leader, a mental health professional, promised to give them psych evaluations when they were arrested that would see them sent to mental institutions rather than prison. I figured there was no way this could be real, but it actually happened several times. And really, the truth gets even crazier. At one point, the real-life Fredo allegedly received an injection of cancer cells from a terminal patient to convince the authorities that he was dying, and then they transferred him to a hospital where he was able to escape. As you can imagine, the real gang's crimes and conspiracies go far beyond what's covered in the show. These were important players during a very chaotic time in Italy's history. And on top of that, they were controlling Rome, a place that even the most established criminal organizations had never been able to dominate. There are so many rabbit holes we could explore here, but then this video wouldn't be about the show anymore. Still, there's one event that's so crazy I just have to talk about it. In Season 1, Episode 5, news breaks that the former Italian Prime Minister Aldo Moro has been kidnapped by the far-left terrorist group, the Red Brigades. 
The gang are asked by the Kimura, who are asked by the government, to track down the communist hideout so they can rescue Moro. Now I'll bet that most of you, like me, are American and had never heard of this before, but it's something any Italian would be familiar with. Banda della Magliana was formed during a time known as the Years of Lead. This was during the Cold War, where tensions between the far right and far left were at their peak, and the conflict hit Italy hard. There was a huge surge of terrorist attacks coming from both sides, and the political landscape was in complete chaos. Moro was a very important political figure. You wouldn't have even had to follow politics to know who he was. He was kidnapped because he was spearheading a deal known as the Historic Compromise, which was an agreement between the Christian Democrats and the Italian Communists that would provide Communists with seats in government. This was a big move that angered a lot of people, including the United States, who were firmly against any country working with Communists. Italy's own Communist movement was also against it because their goal was revolution and they believed this would weaken that effort. So the Red Brigades took it upon themselves to kidnap Moro to stop it from happening. Now, I called them terrorists before, but there are some caveats there. The Red Brigades did use violence for political gain, but their actions were always targeted at political figures and far-right extremists. They kept civilians out of their crossfire. The whole reason the group was formed was in response to the numerous far-right terrorist groups who were not so concerned about collateral damage. Now that's not to say that they were morally justified, but it is important to understand that this is not terrorism in the way that Americans typically think of it. In any case, the Moro kidnapping was very shocking, so much so that there are a lot of conspiracy theories as to how they pulled it off. So the gang gets roped into this in exchange for favors from the government, and several members would later testify that they found a hideout where Moro may have been hidden. According to several witnesses, including Magliana gang member Antonio Mancini, the gang pulled off the miracle and actually discovered the Red Brigade hideout, possibly the one used to keep Moro. They passed this information to Raffaele Cutolo, leader of the Nuova Camorra Organizzata, so that he could pass it in turn to the Italian Secret Service. But the reply they received was chilling. They were told to forget whatever they knew about Moro. The obvious implication is that the order had come from key politicians, probably Andreotti, but likely others as well, since they were no longer interested in trying to save Moro. This wasn't covered in the show, but a member of the gang would later testify that he was asked to forge a letter from the Red Brigades claiming that Moro had been killed. By releasing this and allowing the world to think he was dead, they sent a message to the Brigades that their hostage was essentially useless. And it wasn't long after this that Moro was killed for real. This whole event plays a background piece in the show, and if you're not Italian, it probably won't mean much to you. And that's part of why I wanted to cover it here. For one thing, it was a pretty big deal on a worldwide scale, and I think more people should know about it, but there are also a lot of events like this that occur during the story. They're never the focus, and you can follow everything without knowing the historical significance, but the added context really helps you understand how influential the gang was. These guys were working with politicians, businessmen, even the Catholic Church. If they had ever been tried for the full extent of their crimes, many of the most important people in Rome would have gone down with them. The chaos of the years of lead are definitely felt in the show, especially in the early episode, but it peters out as the series goes on and we focus more on the gang's drama. I consider this to be disappointing, but if I was forced to say something positive about it, I'd say it does a good job of showing how easily they integrated themselves into the system. The Magliana gang is nowhere near as powerful as it once was, but that's mostly because it's not needed anymore. The legitimate powers they worked with got everything they needed from them, and the few surviving members eventually killed each other, were arrested, or just lost all their money. For as terrible as the gang was, the true villain of the story is the larger system that benefited from its crimes. Chi l'ha fatto questo dossier? I radicali. Ottimo lavoro. Dovremmo chiedergli di lavorare per noi. Se vuole lo faccio sequestrare. No. Al prossimo morto nessuno si ricorderà di questa Giorgiana Masi. Sarà solo una lapide su un muro. Noi dobbiamo pensare alla storia. Romanzo Criminale leaves you with a sense of loss. There was nothing good about the Magliana gang. There's no reason to feel sorry for what became of them. 
But it's a weird thing to see them in their later years. The gang was never really defeated, no one put a definitive nail in their coffin, but there's nothing keeping them together anymore. So when various members reminisce about the good old days when everything got started, you understand where they're coming from. These were lower class kids without much opportunity. They probably could have survived without turning to crime, but it would have been a lot of work for little reward. The gang was their first shot at freeing themselves from their class. A bunch of young, ambitious, violent guys ready to take what society would never give them. And while you can and should condemn them for what they did, you can't say they weren't playing by the rules. If anything, they did exactly what anyone is expected to do for wealth and power. They didn't become kings of Rome by breaking the system, they integrated themselves into it, made their crimes an asset to it. Organized crime does not work in opposition to the established order, it is an essential cog in its machine. Romanzo Criminale ends in tragedy, because rather than allowing us to take some comfort in the fact that these remorseless killers lose everything, it reminds us that they were never the root of the problem. They were just kids who wanted more than their circumstances could offer. Music